Hello and welcome to the revision session for paper 2 topic 3 which is the topic of resource management and energy resource management. So um, this is the entire topic as a summary overview and I'll be um, adding extra details and some tips and advice as I go through some of the content for you. It is largely a me talking you making notes session. There are no additional resources to print off from 365 so please make sure you utilize the uh, ability to pause, rewind, go back over anything you need to do and also have a notebook, notebook and pen handy um, should you have any questions that are still remaining that you can then put to me either in an email or um, when you next see me in person so you can um, go through any content you're not sure about. Okay, so just to give you a bit of a summary about uh, paper two, topic three. Firstly, it's divided up into two sections and the first section, which is the resources uh, in general section, is worth 10 of the 34 marks. So within that 10 marks, they're mostly short mark questions um, and the, the biggest one you'll get is a four mark explain style question. So explain or suggest to give reasons or outline um, type questions. So um, you might need to expand your reasons a few times, but you're not going to need to do excessive amounts of work. Um, you may well still utilize specific detail um, from any case studies you might have used um, in the four mark explain questions but just to be mindful that those are not necessarily full case studies they're just examples more on that as we go through um, in the content um, one thing that does appear quite often it seems in this particular topic is use of maps um, but it won't necessarily be there it might be um, they use graphs or other things but um, they will use resources at some point to maybe show you about um, uh, the way in which different other sorts of resources like mineral resources or, or farming agriculture etc are spread around the world um, and if that's the case you need to be prepared to describe distributions and again there is an example of how to do that within the content of the PowerPoint now. Um, the second section which is worth 24 marks is specifically on energy resources so it still looks at resources but it starts to look at energy specifically and um, it'll give you some more detailed case study um, information about places that have got different energy policies sustainable energy programs um, and it will look really with a focus on different types of energy so for example fracking appears in there as a separate section now that's worth 24 marks 12 of those 24 marks are for an 8 mark question plus 4 for SPAG. So this is the topic where the 8 marker is um, awarded uh, SPAG marks as well. Um, so uh, that's what I've just mentioned there. And um, there is another section on here which you do not answer. So we have the option to provide you with uh, content and, and delivery on energy resources or water resources. We've chosen energy, so any questions on water resource management, you do not have to answer. In fact, if you did answer it, all you'd be doing is wasting time. So fortunately, that last section happens at the very end of the topic, um, of the end of the paper, sorry. So hopefully by then you've already used up all your time um, on the eight marker for energy resource management. Okay, but just might be mindful, there is a section you do not have to answer on water resources. Okay, so let's get on with the content now. We will start by looking at the world's natural resources. So it starts in general looking at what we mean by resources um, and natural resources specifically. So the different types of natural resource include biotic and abiotic resources. Now this should not be unfamiliar to you if you've looked at the ecosystems topic, uh, which is the third topic on paper one, because we already, we already look at the biotic and abiotic parts of an ecosystem. So biotic means living, and abiotic means non-living. Um, and resources in general are just anything that we can use or we can um, exploit as humans. So think of anything in the world that you have ever used um, or an ingredient of anything you've ever used, um, that will be something that is classed as a resource. Okay, so it can include minerals, it can include um, food, it can include milk, it can include uh, I don't know, grass for recreation. It's anything really that can be used and exploited by humans. So of those things, the ones that are in the biosphere or the plants and animals in the earth um, that are capable of reproducing are classed as biotic resources. So any animal that we use, any birds, any plants, any trees, anything okay, that is living is a biotic resource. Abiotic are any resources that are non-living. So anything taken from the lithosphere, the land, the atmosphere, the air, or the hydrosphere, the water, um, on Earth, 
that is non-living. So a fish is a biotic resource, whereas the uh, salt water that it lives in is an abiotic resource. Um, so minerals, soil, sunlight, fresh water as well um, can be min sorry can be abiotic resource examples. Okay, so they're non-living. Now we also have a different classification of resources as well that can be split into either non-renewable or renewable. So non-renewable resources are things often that you burn, that's what that word combustible means, um, and they can't be remade. And really, we are talking about fossil fuels here. So um, it takes millions of years for them to form, and once they're gone, they're pretty much gone. So coal, oil, natural gas. Uranium, which is the key component in nuclear power, is technically a non-renewable resource, but there is allegedly so much of it in the earth that it's not at any risk of running out anytime soon. Um, so therefore, I'd be very careful about using uranium as an answer to a question that says name a non-renewable resource. I would stick to your classic fossil fuels of coal, oil and natural gas. So there's no gray area there. Um, renewable resources, on the other hand, are ones that are potentially inexhaustible. That means they will not run out um, and they can be replenished naturally within our time frame, within our time scales. Um, so wind, solar, hydroelectric power, all examples of that. And again, like with anything, there's a bit of a grey area. You could argue that um, biomass, so burning of things like wood chips, um, is a renewable resource because you can grow trees quick enough to replenish that, that store. But again, it's one of those ones where I'd steer clear of if you're asked about a renewable resource um, in an exam question. So how I'd expect this to be seen in an exam is they might well ask you, name a biotic resource or name an abiotic resource. Or it might ask you to define what is meant by non-renewable resources or renewable resources. If that's the case, obviously you need to be able to define it. So renewable resources, you could say something along the lines of they are resources which are potentially inexhaustible. That would be worth a mark. Um, but if it asks you to name a specific example, make sure you don't use those grey area examples of uranium and um, biomass. Try and stick to those clear cut renewables, non-renewables. OK. Oh, and also, sorry, I will just point this out as well. If it asks you to name a bi two biotic resources, and this has been the case in the past, don't say animals and birds in your answer, because birds are animals. Um, they they are the same answer effectively. Specify you know a type of animal. So bird and pig is fine, or birds and oak trees is fine, but don't just say birds and animals, or um, I don't know trees and plants because again they're the same thing a tree is just a type of plant okay right moving on so the next thing you need to be aware of is three examples and they go straight into examples in this topic three examples specifically of how we are over exploiting certain resources and they they name the three resources specifically that they want you to cover so this picture represents oil extraction in Ecuador this picture, which I'm going to show you a few times uh, and go back to a couple of times, represents um, um, North Sea cod, and this one represents deforestation in Cameroon. So oil extraction Ecuador, North Sea cod, and um, deforestation in Cameroon. Now those three, they specifically identify, and you need to be aware of ways in which we are um, exploiting those resources and some of the impacts that's having on the places. So starting with Ecuador. Extracting oil um, in Ecuador is the Oriente region, um, and again, there's some good stats for you. In the 1960s, the oil company Texaco, um, they built, built 350 oil wells, and they opened a 1,000 unlined pits, which they then proceeded to fill with toxic sludge, uh, which went into the rivers. So the knock-on effects of that, of their actions, were uh, through exploiting that oil, um, were that it poisoned the river quality, um, it killed the fish that were in there, lots of them, um, it affected the tribes that were drinking and cooking and bathing and, and getting their main food source from those rivers um, in, in Ecuador, but also um, it led to um, health other, other health complications. For example, um, they specify a greater number of miscarriages and birth defects from the children born in the tribes in the areas where they were using that water source. So that one is a bit of a, a crime against humanity, the oil extraction in Ecuador, uh, and Texaco have a lot to answer for. Now, the second example is about 
overfishing in the North Sea. So again, we have covered this to some extent in the ecosystems topic because it's one of the UK's marine resources um, and fishing and, and the idea of fishing is something which goes across both this one and the ecosystems topic from paper one. So there's a bit of crossover here. I'm just going to go back a couple of pictures so you can see some of the stats um, because what you need to be aware of and how we're exploiting the fish of the North Sea is from the stats in this image here. So the number of boats hasn't changed much. It has gone down slightly over that sort of 70-year um, period. Um, but what's more um, apparent is that we are catching more fish from abroad. Okay, Before 1937, no, there was no tons of foreign catch, whereas 129,000 tons of foreign catch in 2008. Um, the number of fish and chip shops, which obviously sell a lot of cod, most popular fish in the UK, um, they have declined by well, you know, 25,000 or 24,500 in that space of time. That's quite a big drop. And um, the number of people actually within the industry as a whole, not just fishermen or fisher people, um, but the people that pack it, process it, you know, the wholesalers, the number of people has declined from 31,000 to 12,000. Um, but this is really where we want to focus our attention. Look at the difference in figures here. The cod catch in tons, 347,000 tons of cod caught in the North Sea in 1937, whereas in 2008, 19,000. Now, some of that will be because there's quotas on how many cod you can catch, but it's mostly because there's so few fish left in the North Sea um, that that's all you can pretty much get um, nowadays. Um, the total haddock catch, because it's not just cod, again, has declined from 94,000 to 33,000, um, and the cost of cod has gone up because of the fact there is less of it available. Rather than 53p per pound, it's almost doubled to 95 pence a pound for cod now as well. So UK fishing has changed a lot, and this, this diagram shows you how much, but the key stat really is this, this cod and haddock um, stats about how much actually we've overfished those areas. So this diagram kind of gives you a bit of a flavour of all those different things. The size of the fish has changed too, but an unsustainable fishing practice, um, it's it's gone up in terms of popularity, um, or it had gone up in popularity, but the cod numbers have declined so much in the last 100 years that we're having to, you know, really do take quite vast steps to let those numbers recover. And they do seem to be recovering. In the last 10 or so years, they have started to go up again. Um, and that's largely because of quotas, but also because of better sustainable fishing practices. Okay, and the last one is about deforestation in Cameroon. So again, one of the uh, the knock-on effects of, of um, deforesting that area is that we get rid of these 600 plus species of tree. We put them into danger, which has a knock-on effect on all the different animals that live in those species of tree. Um, and there's, again, specific stats there. The reason we're deforesting areas of Cameroon is largely because we want to plant palm oil plantations. Um, and they are a very profitable crop, um, palm oil. You'll find it in lots of products. I don't know if it still is the case, so please don't sue me, the company, Nutella. But it certainly was an ingredient in Nutella, as well as, as, well as many um, shampoo brands like Herbal Essences. Again, if it's not used in there anymore, please don't, someone from there, sue me. Um, but um, you just, again, need to be aware of another example of how we've exploited or over-exploited natural resources um, and the knock-on effects of that. So we've got oil extraction in Ecuador, North Sea overfishing and deforestation in Cameroon. Okay, so um, this is one of those uh, examples I was giving you about a map that shows where resources are. Now this map is a bit simplistic, um, but it does show you uh, some key things. And this one shows you the global distribution of a few um, energy and mineral resources. And you can see on the key, there's a little kind of, if it's a circle, it's an energy resource. If it's a triangle, it's a mineral resource. Um, and the different colour will denote what resource is found where. So this is the sort of question you might be faced with. It says, study the world map, describe, so no reasons given here at all, describe the global distribution of copper. So it specifically wants you to look at copper. Now, when you describe distributions at all, this is really good advice, use your descriptive kind of key terms here, even or uneven, um, linear, clustered, sparse, dense, um, and consider quoting, or definitely try, and quote specific locations. If it gives you details, use those details from the map. Okay, It's not asking you to come up with any reasons why you'll find these things where you find them. It might do, but in this particular question it doesn't. It's asking you where they are. So you are just looking at the map 
and using the map as best as you can to give the distribution of whatever resource it asks for. So for copper, what I'd expect you to do is identify firstly the copper is the orange triangle and then start to try and locate orange triangles on your map. Now if this is in a resource booklet you know you can draw all over it it's not a problem okay that resource booklet is not going to get used again um, so you can see a bit in Australia a bit in um, South Africa here and, and some of the other African states um, you can see it a little bit in Asia this is just on the sort of far northwest of China um, little bits up here as well in uh, I don't know where that is Kazakhstan I don't know um, you can see some in Eastern Europe up here some in Canada um, but you've got large amounts uh, that form what looks a bit like a line in North America on the west side and what looks like a line in South America on the west coast as well following the Andes mountain range so now we've identified some of the copper uh, deposits we need to, need to describe where we find some of them now describing where they're found firstly it's not found evenly everywhere so you can say and probably get a mark straight away by saying the distribution of copper globally is uneven tick um, then there's patterns there is a line of copper deposits found on the west coast of South America using a, a, a reference point using a pattern tick um, you could then say um, there are other deposits sparsely spread out or there are other you know um, distributed deposits that are quite far apart for example in South Africa and northeastern Australia northwestern China so again you've named a separate point you've used the map and you've identified where the copper deposits can be found so here's like a, a, an answer you could have gone for um, the world the map shows the world's copper resources are in Europe Africa Oceania North America and South America they go I mean that just names continents where you find copper deposits so that's a really simple point as well say what you see South America has one of the highest copper reserves in a line along the west coast, we, we found that. There is also large amounts of copper in South Africa. Again, that might be something you have knowledge, but the map doesn't tell you there that's large amounts. It just tells you that there's, there's one bit of copper um, in South Africa. Now, there is quite a lot of copper in South Africa, but this map doesn't tell you that, so I wouldn't expect you to know that point, but there are plenty of other points you could get just by describing this map. Okay. Um, if it does ask you about why certain minerals are found where they are, again, you do have that in your notes, but lots of minerals, like gold, um, tend to be found where you've got places that are volcanic. So tectonically active areas that bring up these minerals from deep below the Earth's uh, surface. Um, whereas fossil fuels, they're often found in sedimentary rock because they are made of the buildup of sediments. So, for example, um, coal is essentially just you know fossilized remains of forests um, that's been packed over time by layers and layers and layers and layers of rock and that makes it sedimentary okay again there's a bit more link here to things like geology which is something you'd find in topic one of paper one okay so moving on now the uh, minerals and energy resources are not the only resources that you need to know about in general there's also the resources that are kind of more human induced so we we create those resources so agriculture or farming forestry trees and some of them are natural some of them are planted um, are two other different types of resource that we have uh, we see globally you know most places in the world have some form of agriculture some form of farming and most have some form of forestry not all now this map is quite handy it tells it shows you the different areas of um forestry because it appears on this map as green and um, these are our rainforests and you've also got deciduous forests up in like the in Europe and and, and um, North America but what you can't see because this is a particular time of year um, is this is more winter is you can't see actually the lines of boreal forest or taiga which almost encircle the entire earth It's the long longest I think continuous um, forest effectively found on earth um, and you'll find those a bit further north and south. So naturally occurring, the climate will depend will determine the type of forestry you could expect to find. So you'll get things like your tropical rainforests in the very nice, hot and humid and constantly wet and sunny parts of the earth near the equator. Um, and you'll also find your tundra areas, um, but a bit maybe further south than tundra. These areas aren't particularly great, um, where you'll find your boreal forest or your taiga forests, which will grow at high altitudes as well. Now, when it comes to um, agriculture, you'll tend to find that 
you get agriculture everywhere even in deserts where there aren't many trees which so where you won't find forestry in those desert areas but you will still find agriculture it's just a different type of agriculture it's nomadic herding whereas you think about um agriculture you'd find in the uk the flat areas you'll get arable agriculture and in the hilly areas you'll get things like um, sheep farming for example okay so again don't rule out agriculture and forestry as also um, resources uh, and having an awareness of where they occur and why because of latitude and climate is important too okay so um, now we're going to zoom into the UK specifically because again this example would like looking at UK uh, as it that's where you're from it seems sensible um, and the UK have um, again we've got natural resources in the form of minerals um, and energy resources and we've also got agricultural and forestry resources too uh, and again these are all linked often to either historic tectonic activity geology in terms of sedimentary rocks and also climate so one of the climate factors that determines where you've got um, water because again water is a resource is how much rain there is and this map on the left just shows you there is quite a lot of rain um, in the blue areas the northwest highlands of scotland um, places like the lake district up here um, up around here sort of ayrshire um, dumfries and galloway that sort of thing um, wales again highest on the hilly areas and the southwest of the uk particularly places like dartmoor exmoor so the west of the uk is wet for a, a, a good reason firstly it's more mountainous so you'll get something called relief rainfall so where air is forced to rise over mountains it cools and condenses and that creates rain the other factor um, is that you'll get um, moist air coming from the Atlantic Ocean the North Atlantic which comes over here so the prevailing wind in the UK comes from the southwest and so we get a lot of moist air coming across us this way so by the time it gets to East Anglia which is one of the driest parts of the country um, it's it's probably rained out it's had to go over these mountains first and foremost then it's gone over this land where it's had a chance to dry out and by the time it gets to east anglia you know a lot of the moisture is gone and that's why our average annual rainfall we're one of the driest parts of the country uh, in east anglia because we are the furthest east um, and we're, we're relatively flat as well so we don't get relief rainfall any rainfall we get here is mainly what's called frontal so a different kind of weather fronts meeting and pushing air or convectional OK, so um, we've got high precipitation levels in the north and west, um, which unfortunately is not where most people live. So we do have to transfer some of those water resources via things like pipelines. So agriculture, and we've already mentioned that, oh, there, there you go, that's just showing you the different um, population densities. So um, London, Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester, Sheffield, Leeds, this is where most of the people live, obviously down the southeast. Um, and whereas most of the water is kind of located at these places you can almost not see they look like a squashed mosquito okay um, agriculture wise that all depends on the type of soil and the relief as well but climate's a factor as well there so if you've got flat land which is easily drained um, but you can irrigate it fine then it's good for growing crops such as wheat and that's why East Anglia is well known for its arable farming whereas in upland areas you can still farm um, but it's more sheep farming, more pastoral farming. Um, so again, this relates to this relief map. Now, this looks remarkably similar to the precipitation map, but that's because of relief rainfall. But what you'll find here, this flat part of the UK, you're going to find much more kind of arable, so crop farming, uh, wheat, barley, things like that. Whereas on these kind of parts of the uh, UK or the, uh, these parts of these areas, you'll find things like sheep farming far more common because sheep are pretty good up hills, whereas tractors aren't quite so good. Um, and then um, another thing, again, with the UK is, is quite well known for is our oil and gas reserves. Um, and that is extracted from the North Sea. And we do produce billions of barrels each year, but the, the supply is dwindling. And this shows you these little black dots that show you new discoveries of oil since 2000. Now, that's 20 years ago now, so that's quite a long time. Um, um, and you've got your gas fields here and your oil fields here. And then you've got mixed fields, which we don't actually have much of. There's a tiny little portion here and a little bit here. Um, and a lot of these other ones are in the Dutch sector, the Danish sector, etc. Now, we might be aware of Bacton gas terminal, which gets a lot of the gas from the North Sea over to us but the North Sea is really going to be the basis for the new energy revolution which is going to involve us um, really utilizing um, our wind uh, uh, availability um, to try and replace 
com not completely uh, and certainly in the long term that's the plan but um, not in the short term replace our reliance on oil and gas because we don't actually have enough gas for our needs um, we actually buy in quite a bit of our gas from other nations um, so it's just w worthwhile mentioning that this is a dwindling resource even though it's been quite a big resource for us in the past um, okay um, and, and not just that the UK does have other minerals you know other precious metals tin for example um, that you'd find in the tin mines of, of Cornwall down in the southwest um, as well as other places where there's been historic tectonic activity that's occurred okay so um, global usage oh I should have mentioned coal as well you know we're known for our coal mining back in the day still quite a bit of coal in the UK but again where sedimentary rocks once were is where you'll find your coal deposits anyway so um, the next part of the sort of generic first 10 mark um, section of this paper is not about where resources are and why they're found there but now about how they're used uh, and and the fact that we do use them is not a bad thing if humans didn't use water and food and energy we would die so it's really important that we do consume and use resources but the issue is that the um, resources that we've got available to us um, mean that we are a bit wasteful uh, whereas other parts of the world don't have the same resources as we do so water is a really good example if you live in Ethiopia where there's drought again a nice hint towards the um, topic of uh, weather hazards and climate change there um, where there's drought there's less available water whereas in the UK we've got plenty you know we've got plenty to go around we're not at risk of a shortage anytime soon um, and, and that links to food as well um, but energy again is another factor that we have to consider so um, this is a kind of a global summary about how much energy and water and food in general so collectively put together that we utilize in different parts of the world so purple they're the wasteful parts of the world or they're the ones that use the most energy so China and the USA they're really your two that we're, we're looking at there but the UK doesn't escape we are again using quite a lot of energy um, and food and water again relative to our needs um, so food is measured by the way in calories intake um, water is just volume of water in gallons um, and energy is amount of um, millions of tons of oil equivalent probably so how much energy we use and again have a look at this map and, and make just make note of a few of the, the the aspects here so America known as being the most obese nation on the planet um, they have incredible um, calorie consumption relative to other parts of the world and um, sometimes 10 times higher per day than certain parts of the world um, certain areas um, use a lot of energy for example um, the Sudan um, uses a lot of, although this doesn't point to the Sudan, um, uses um, lots of energy um, for things like um, developing air conditioning units, for example. But also, um, that would be sort of uh, for the wealthier parts, not so much the Sudan, but the wealthier parts of Africa, Northern Africa, do overuse energy. But, and the Middle East as well, you can see here, Saudi Arabia, hugely wasteful. But the green and below, they are parts that are less wasteful because they don't necessarily have the money to access that energy resources. Um, so again, thinking about the potential energy of solar here, but the fact that they can't actually invest in solar means that they don't they don't end up using that much energy because they can't afford it. Um, so you've got your different areas and, and the different factors around it. There you go. You've got Ghana here. They survive on fewer than 2,000 calories per day, which is really often the recommended daily intake for just an average person. In Ghana, where the, the climate is very warm, it's running right the equator, they're going to be burning more calories than that. Um, so actually, it's it's quite tricky, and they're, they're, it leads to malnutrition and undernutrition in many parts of the world. Okay, so a summary, really, of how wasteful we can be with three aspects. And I would actually encourage you to go back over your notes to look specifically at water, then specifically at food, and then specifically at energy, um, and ways in which that we are using it more or less in certain parts of the world. Okay. So now we're going to move on to the second part of this topic. So this is again worth more marks um, and it's going to require you to know far more specific detail. I can't imagine in the first 10 marks there's going to be many questions that require you to name stats and figures. It's a quite common sense part. And if you don't believe me, get a past paper. I promise you that they're, they're not challenging questions. This part you're going to find more and more difficult questions. You know, name one thing where you have to explain or you have to specifically link a case study a bit of detail to your answer. So the first thing you need to be aware of in this topic is the differences between a non-renewable energy resource and a renewable energy resource. And you need to know a specific one. So 
it will ask you specifically either about coal or about wind. It might not say coal or wind, it might just say non-renewable or renewable. So you need to be prepared to quote coal or wind depending on what they ask for. So for each one of these two, you need to know positives and negatives of using that particular or developing that particular resource. So um, positives of coal is that it provides a lot of energy, generates vast amounts, um, it's relatively cheap, there's still enough to last the next 200 years or so, even in the UK that's apparently how much we could mine. But the negatives of coal and the reason why it's really kind of dying out quite quickly is that it releases greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, it pollutes the air as well, makes it very unhealthy, it's incredibly dangerous, mining for coal leads to a lot of deaths um, and uh, it's expensive to, to mine an area that hasn't been mined before. So even though there's enough to last 200 years, you've got to spend money to get it. So positives and negatives. And again, you've got a vast list of positives and negatives for coal specifically in your notes. Um, now to, to match that up against a renewable energy resource, which we again have mentioned we use wind. Again, you need to know about the positives or advantages and disadvantages. So lack of um, uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere is a good thing. And as a renewable, it's the lowest price resource and the UK is heavily investing in this. We really want to up our wind intake um, from energy resources by you know, 2030, I think Boris has mentioned. Um, but unfortunately, if it's not windy, it doesn't make energy. Um, and some people don't like how they look, although I think they look all right. Look nicer than a coal power station anyway. They also cost relatively high amounts to develop, although when you locate them offshore, it is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper um, to actually produce even more and more efficient um, wind turbines. So the, the technology is getting better all the time. Uh, you can see I'm a bit of a fan of wind energy, so I'm trying to negate these negatives. Now, any part of a topic where it asks you about positives and negatives, prepare yourself for a potential evaluate eight mark question. This wouldn't be a specific one necessarily, but you do have specific detail that you can incorporate. So if you were given an example of uh, you know, evaluate... Um, uh, renewable energy as the future okay or evaluate the benefits of renewable energy the question really because it says evaluate I know it says benefits but you evaluate anything you have to give the benefits and disadvantages and remember our structure one paragraph on renewable energy source one paragraph on non-renewable energy source and then one conclusion which identifies overall is renewable the future or isn't it okay so essentially prepare yourself for an uh, uh, evaluate question that you know anytime you see things where there's positives and negatives and try and make sure in your notes at least you've revised specific detail because remember to get those um, level three standard kind of answers seven eight marks or even top of level two you need to try and put in some good stats facts figures okay so um, another aspect that I really really want to draw your attention to purely because it's been an eight mark question in the past is this thing called the energy mix. So an energy mix is any combination, so per place, per country, the combination of the different sources of energy that they use. So for example, the UK doesn't just get all of its energy from coal or all of its energy from wind. We get some from coal, some from wind, some from nuclear, some from natural gas, some from oil, some from hydro, some from geothermal. Da, 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 da. So we, there's varying amounts of different energy sources that we that go into the pot that create all our energy that we use daily now the demand and supply of energy is increasing uh, because of a few things um, and that's going to affect the energy mix and I'll get onto the energy mix more specifically in a moment so the three reasons why demand is going up um, and therefore supply is going up to change it firstly there's more of us countries like China and Brazil and you know the developing nations the population is increasing massively um, and you know we're still gonna you know we're not gonna top out they reckon until about 10 billion so we've still got quite a way to go um, and more people means you need to provide them with more energy um, because those people are gonna maybe drive cars or they're gonna use electricity or they're gonna burn um, wood for their fires or whatever it might be so that's one thing we use more energy because there are more people Another reason we use more energy is because not only are there more people, but people are getting richer. And as people get wealthier and have more money to spend, they buy stuff. And stuff 
uses energy to be created. It, it requires energy to make. Um, not only that, um, we also maybe can afford cars which use oil um, and again to get from A to B and cars can be a bit of a status symbol um, and the faster your car the more oil it tends to use. So the wealthier people get the more stuff we want uh, and producing that stuff and transporting that stuff um, and uh, you know buying that stuff in the first place uses energy in the whole process. So there's more of us than ever before. We're getting wealthier and therefore buying more stuff um, please don't use buying stuff in an exam. Be more specific. Um, but the last thing is um, we are actually ad getting advanced at um, utilising our energy. So um, firstly, because there's more electrical goods out there than ever before, most of the goods that we buy tend to be technology. I mean, think about your Christmas list. What's on top of it? It's probably something a bit techy, something that requires a little bit of energy to power. Not always, but it might do. Um, so we're getting more energy hungry because more of the stuff we do buy um, requires energy. Even like toys require batteries and things like that. Renewable energy as well um, is being harnessed. Um, so because we are now taking advantage of our new technology to harness the wind, excuse me, and geothermal power stations and uh, getting um, energy from the land and hydroelectric power from water, etc., you know, we're still using coal, oil, gas, but we're also now using other things too, which we didn't use before. So that means we're overall using more energy. And lastly, um, we're still getting better at accessing our old energy resources. So we used to be, you know, okay at getting coal. Now we're even better at getting coal. We can get the most out of coal because the technology has improved to, to help utilize the coal that we do have. So um, there we go. More people, more money, and better tech and they're all three reasons why our amount of energy and you can see from this graph here the amount of energy that we've we've consumed in the world has gone up there are times when it goes down a little bit um, and also you know advances in technology can include things which reduce energy use you know washing machines dishwashers are super efficient you know before there was like a an a rating for a really energy efficient um, utilities but because we've got better at making utilities efficient they had to go A+, plus, then A++, plus plus, and you can even get A++++ plus 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 rated energy efficiency washing machines and dishwashers. So it is possible to use the same tech that uses less energy. Um, so that is possible, but that does rely on people getting even wealthier because those things cost quite a bit. So um, variations in energy mix um, and energy use tend to revolve around three main factors. Firstly, how many people there are in your country. If you've got a big population, you will use more energy. So we've already linked the, the growth of population to energy use. China, biggest population in the world. Um, India very closely following. Um, they've got a large population. And so because of their large population, not only do they use a lot of energy, but they also have quite a big energy mix because they don't have enough of one type to help their whole population out. So they've got to say, right, we need to have this much from coal, but we've still got a few million people that can't get energy that way. So we're going to have to use this much from solar and this much from wind. Um, but there's still a few we need to get some from hydroelectric. And then there's still a few left and they need to get some from uh, biomass. OK, so there's a number of different things they have to use just to make enough energy for their whole population because it's so massive. Another factor which affects how much is used and the size of the energy mix and the variation in different types of energy is how much money you've got. If you've got more money, if you've, you're wealthier, it means that not only can you, um, you know, you're using more energy, so therefore there's demand high, but you can also invest in ways to try and get more energy. Um, so the USA invest in lots of different energy mix types. They, you know, they've really invested heavily in fracking, hydraulic fracturing, more on that soon. Um, and they can develop renewables um, and they've got the money to put into new tech to really utilize what energy there is available out there. Um, and a lot of it might be sort of renewable for free, but it costs money to invest in. Whereas if you're less wealthy, like uh, it mentions here, Pakistan, they will only really be able to afford a few things. So they'll rely on whatever they can afford. So they buy in a lot of imported oil. Um, so they have a higher proportion of oil for most of their energy needs. And then the last factor and this is probably the most obvious one that determines how much energy or different energy sources you use is if you can physically do it. So in the UK, 
we've got lots of wind energy available to us. We've got tides because we're an island. So that's available for us to develop. What we don't have very much of is geothermal power. So, you know, a power from the, the, the earth. We've got some geothermal activity under us, but it's not very volatile and it's certainly um, not very close to the surface. So that means it's quite expensive for us to get any tectonic, you know, geothermal energy. Whereas in Iceland, it's a piece of pie because they've got, you know, they're basically a big volcano. Um, so we have to import oil and coal, uh, but we also, um, actually we don't have to import coal, we just choose to, um, but we can also um, use what we've got so we've got coal, we've got oil, but we can also, sorry, use things like wind power because we've got good um, wind reserves in our coastal waters. We've got tidal reserves, etc. So um, we've got gas fields off the coast as well. So we c we've got a wider energy mix because of things that are available to us. So population, wealth and availability, three factors that can really determine how much, how many different energy types you've got. Now this is where I'm going to... Um, refer to that eight mark question again so the UK's energy mix I've shown in this I say I've the revision guide because this is where this is taken from has shown um, how the mix has changed from the 1970s to sort of closer to today so coal you can see has massively gone down to kind of about 15 20 percent where it is kind of stabilizing oil has stayed fairly stable because again we're still driving as many cars if not more cars than ever before but some of them are getting more efficient Gas has grown, um, shrunk slightly, but it's still we still rely very heavily on gas. And then you've got your bioenergy, waste, and um, renewable electricity, so primary electricity, things you take directly from the, the air or land or sea or whatever it might be. So you can see that proportion, although it's still not very massive, has gone up. We still rely quite heavily on fossil fuels. Um, but in the 70s, we certainly relied even more, you know, 98-ish percent there was fossil fuels um, and only a, you know, a few percent, you know, two or three percent was actually renewables, whereas that proportion has increased. So it's going the right way. And the UK are pretty good, actually, at developing these things compared to other countries, but there's still work to be done. So the UK's energy mix has changed and this shows you how. Um, there are two other places that I've, I've you know, cut from um, other resources here um, this represents India's uh, energy mix so this is UK's energy mix let's take 2014 we've got coal oil gas um, bioenergy and renewables okay so we've got five different colors so let's say five sources of energy in our mix India have got one two three four five as well Iceland have only got one two three so firstly the energy mixes are different because Iceland have less variety the other way that they're different is that um, India's predominant resource is coal, whereas that's nowhere near the most dominant source in the UK. Um, Iceland's predominant source is geothermal. Okay, So there are clear differences in these particular energy mixes, um, and this is lucky because you've got it in front of you. Now, the eight mark question that was given um, in uh, 2018, I believe, was that... Um, it was something along the lines of, I can't quote it exactly word for word, okay, because I haven't got it in front of me, but it was along the lines of, um, assess the reasons for why energy mixes vary globally. So you had to basically try and include in that specific detail from either the UK or India or Iceland, um, and you're identifying the reasons why they have different energy mixes. So these are the reasons we've mentioned already. If they're available, how much money they've got, what's their population like? OK, so one of the paragraphs might be something along the lines of um, Iceland have a very small energy mix. They rely on three main sources of energy, hydro, geothermal and oil. Geothermal is by far the biggest. Um, now, this is because, again, this is the reason of availability, because Iceland have geothermal activity quite close to the surface. They're able to utilize geothermal power. Iceland, um, when you compare that then to what's available in India, coal, hugely available in India, and that's why, and it's cheap as well, so that's why um, coal is one of the main factors um, in India, whereas you look at the UK, we've got wind energy being able to develop more, not hugely, but more, and gas as well, which is quite large, because we've got gas offshore, um, we've got offshore oil as well, which is blue, so these are available to us, and wind, wind energy is available. So that's a comparison 
one paragraph that talks about you know the reasons for energy mixes being different the first one is availability so you do a paragraph on availability so it might go along the lines of you know one reason or one factor that affects the different energy mixes in a place is is that energy source available for example in Iceland they've got lots of geothermal energy uh, whereas uh, I don't know, India rely more than 50% on coal because that's available in their local area, whereas the UK has oil, gas and wind power, which make up a large proportion of their energy mix. Something along those lines. Okay, And look, you've got stats you could include. Another paragraph then might focus on wealth as a factor. So also wealth makes a difference. You know, the UK is a wealthy nation, therefore has the money to develop renewable energy technologies such as wind and hydro or whatever it might be. Um, whereas India are a nation with less money and therefore rely on a cheaper source of energy, which is coal. Okay, again, that explains why their coal is such a dominant um, energy resource. Or you could even do a, a paragraph about population being a factor. So um, Iceland have very, very few different types of energy in their energy mix because their population is um, less than, you know, the less than I don't know 500,000 people I think it's probably about two to three hundred thousand people so Iceland is effectively just two Norwiches in terms of its size so therefore they don't need to rely on lots of different energy mixes or energy sources um, because they don't have that many people to provide energy for whereas India have got a population of like 1.2 billion so they are huge populations, so they have to have a wider variety of energy sources um, and also energy resources like coal, which can produce a lot of energy, are useful to them as well for that factor. So availability, wealth, population, all linked into three specific examples and about how these things link. So these would be your paragraph kind of topics, your aspects. And, you know, you'd only do two of those three in the time you've got, but also your conclusion needs to talk about which factor, which one of these factors, if it's a CES question, which factor, availability, wealth or population, do you think is the most significant factor determining the energy mix? So, you know, do you only do what's available to you? Is that Does that determine the mix? You know, we've got wind, we've got um, uh, oil, we've got gas, we've got coal reserves, all of those things that appear in the UK. So therefore, is that the reason, is that more important and why our energy mix is able to be so varied? Or... Is it more to do with um, population? You know, do we have a wider mix because we've got a bigger population than Iceland? Although we've got the same mix, it looks like, as India, which has a far bigger population than us. So think about which one of these is the most significant factor and affects the most uh, or creates the most decision making kind of clout. And that would be what you base your conclusion around. OK, I know I've spent a long time looking at that, but that is, like I say, because it was an eight marker, it's clearly something the exam board are um, quite keen for you to focus on okay uh, so I'm sorry this is on the her huh on the side um, you need to know about you need to know, need to know about impacts of non-renewable energy resources as well so you're gonna have to know impacts of renewable but the easiest way to present this information again is using the uh, revision guide is this table so like with anything it's got positives and negatives so it could be certainly primed for an evaluate question I suspect it's more likely to be found in a four mark question where you have to explain something or provide advantages, disadvantages in a, in a four mark question. Um, sort of so less important than maybe an eight marker. But you need to be aware for non-renewable resources, the impact specifically on people and the environment. So if it was an eight mark question, I'd anticipate these both being mentioned. So it might say something like... Um, evaluate the benefits or the impacts of non-renewable energy resources on people and the environment in which case you'd have to do a paragraph on the effects of people and you could cite specific stuff about coal or oil or gas or just pick one basically um, and then another paragraph about the environment and again positives negatives about coal oil natural gas uranium and then a conclusion overall do you think it's positive or negative you know, for people in the environment, or a bit of both. Okay, so this one I would I would urge you to kind of just check your notes, make sure it's there, but pause the screen if you've not got this. And again, because it could be an eight marker, make sure in your notes you've got some specific detail that you could do. So I would I would you know arguably I'd get you to maybe create your own table where you add a bit more detail than the revision guide's given you, because actually specific detail is going to be needed for that level three quality of response in an eight marker should you get one so i'd pause the screen now to get that done 
Now, following this, obviously, you could easily be asked about renewable energy resources. So once you've done this activity, you can unpause and... Oh, no, fracking. We're going to go back off that. Um, you need to know about impacts of renewable energy resources. I'll come back to fracking in a minute. So, again, in this example that's just taken from the revision guide, it focuses on hydroelectric power, wind and solar I think that's it yep so wind and solar so just like this task okay I would I would say it's probably worthwhile you going on here creating a table rather than how they've done it and then specifically using your notes to add a bit of extra specific detail because just like that last bit we did you could easily get an eight mark question on the impacts or evaluating the impacts of developing renewable energy resources on people and the environment. You can see it's the same sections. Okay, people, environment, thumbs up, thumbs down means good or bad, advantage, disadvantage, but very little in the way of specific information. Now I know for a fact you've got specific detail about the Three Gorges Dam in China, but we're going to go onto that a bit more in a minute anyway. So once you've, again, I'll pause this screen so you can do one bit of your. Um, uh, da, 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 what was I saying? Yeah, one one bit of your table for renewable resources. Um, when you're ready, unpause it, and I'll put the other screen on. And then I'm going to go back to fracking. Okay, so I'm going to move it on. So pause it now. Get this down. Add some details, specific ones for an eight marker, and then do the same for this. Add these to your table. So you've got hydroelectric power, wind power, and solar power with specific detail incorporated. it tends to suggest here that solar power has no positive um, things for the environment, but that's not true. Um, solar power is something which doesn't produce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, although it does use toxic metals like cadmium, they can all be recycled. Um, so cadmium can be recycled. It can harm the environment if you allow it to go into the soil, um, but it can be recycled, reused. So um, there are benefits of using solar power for the environment, um, which means we're not releasing CO2 into the atmosphere. So pause the screen, add these to your table, and then when you're ready, unpause, and I'm going to go back to fracking. Okay, so um, hopefully you've got now two tables, one for non-renewable resources and one for renewable resources, and you've got advantages and disadvantages for both on people and the environment. Crikey, there's a lot there. So fracking. Um, you need to know what fracking is, and the, the proper term for fracking is hydraulic fracturing. Um, and hydraulic fracturing or fracking is something which, again, they put as a separate section on the exam board, so it's worthwhile being uh, aware of it. It's something the UK was very popular, uh, so it was very kind of keen to try and develop, and the UK government particularly so, in spite of some of the disadvantages associated with it, but they have kind of gone very quiet about fracking of late. Um, and um, there's been a lot of things about tremors and earthquakes in the area that they've been doing it by this company called Quadrilla. So they've been in Lancashire, um, this company Quadrilla, C-U-A-D-R-I-L-L-A, -L -L -A, I think. Um, look it up if you're not sure. Uh, and there'll be lots of campaigns like Frack Off and stuff like that, which you can find detail about. But you need to be aware about what fracking is, how it works. So essentially, they drill down quite a narrow little well thing here, and then they go sideways. Okay, don't ask me how. They've got very clever technology that does it. So once they've drilled their little hole, then they get the drill out. Then they put down this other little thing, whatever that is. I'm being really useful here, aren't I? Which shoots out left and right, okay, or up and down, looking at this diagram, into the rock and, and fractures it. Now, this rock contains gas and sometimes oil, depending on where you're going, and it shoots out and it fractures it, hence the hydraulic fracturing part. So that's where they, they use hydraulics and high force to break this rock apart. But they don't just shove rock in there, uh, sorry, air in it. They put sort of a mixture of chemicals, water, and sand. Now, the sand's really important because that fires little bits into the cracks, which keep the cracks open and allow all the gas to come out. So once they've um, hydraulically fractured and shoved sand in to keep the cracks open, the gas then comes up the fluid and escapes and gets collected up here. Um, so once it gets collected, um, they then use that and they can burn it as, a, as another sort of source of fossil fuel. Um, and I think in the UK, there's enough shale gas to provide energy for the next 70 years, which is great. I mean, 70 years isn't that long in the grand scheme of things, but it's a good temporary measure while we may be developing renewables. 
But um, although it helps reduce our dependence on imported gas from places like Russia, where we don't necessarily want to be relying on too much for various geopolitical reasons, um, it's still a fossil fuel and there are still negatives about it. Um, much of which you will see if you literally do a quick YouTube search on it. So you just need to be aware of the for and against of fracking. Okay, um, and there is much more detail about the for and against than just these ones on here. Please make sure you do do a bit of additional research on that. Okay, so that's fracking done and we've done that. Now, meeting energy demands. Again, a very another very common source of an eight mark question, potentially anyway, uh, in an exam. So we need to meet energy demands and we're aware that um, energy is a, a commodity uh, and a resource that we need to try and manage quite well because the population's going up, we're getting richer, we're using more of it, etc, etc. So because of that, you need to be aware of differing views or differing um, attitudes about how we meet energy demands and you need to be aware of how those views come from firstly people, individuals, um, organisations, so companies, but also governments. So three sort of different um, areas where these views are coming from. Now, th universally, it's quite regarded that we need to manage resources because fossil fuels are running out uh, and they make up such a large amount of the energy that we have and use that they need to be replaced with something because when they run out, if we don't, then we're going to be knackered. So um, the other thing we've mentioned as well, more people, people get richer, um, that's all going to increase that supply and we need more from renewable resources as much as possible anyway. But also, um, we've become much more aware about the fact that we're using fossil fuels and they're having an effect on the environment. Um, so the UK's average ecological footprint is actually four to five times bigger than the global average. So we are, we've got our own problems in the UK of being wasteful and we, we've got to try and resolve that. And we are doing what we can, but we could maybe do some more. So you need to be aware of differing attitudes towards managing energy demands. And we're going to focus on those three categories I mentioned, individuals, organisations and governments. But you need to be aware of some of the basic kind of attitudes. So fracking is one example we've just looked at. A lot of people don't like fracking because it's one of those issues where there is positives and negatives. The UK government quite like fracking. They want to try and exploit the fact that we've got this gas source which relies, or so reduces our reliance on places like Russia uh, and Norway maybe. But um, a lot of people say, well, hang on a minute, it's creating earthquakes and land sinking where we live um, and it's releasing uh, contaminated um kind of wastewater because the chemicals you pump down through the process into the water supply which is damaging habitats and species so you know there is very much a, a big argument around fracking and whether it's good or bad but fracking is just one example again look up on youtube how many different arguments there are for or against fracking um there are other things um and again we're going to mention these specifically about how a lot of the organizations like and they're on board with developing renewable technology because um they could financially benefit from it. And a lot of places that are utilising fracking also will benefit financially from it. So it's about trying to marry up these different ideas about people and the environment, sorry, and the environment and um, also the different people involved to so the government and the, the companies involved in developing different resources. We, again, which fracking is just one. But there are these other people as well, Greenpeace, you may have heard of them, who are also they're just like, let's go 100% renewable. And there's a bit of an argument to say that that's not realistic if we want to keep using the energy we use. Um, so it's being aware of different attitudes about profit and environment and how it affects people that live in those areas uh, and those views differ. So be mindful of those different attitudes. So meeting energy demands, because we, we know we need to, those differing views... Um, can then feed into kind of ways in which we can manage our energy usage. So um, individuals, how can we one to one basis? And again, you've got far more notes about this in your your um, book. So I'd, I'd urge you to look at those individuals are using far more energy efficient products than ever before. And that includes things like light bulbs or they're investing in solar panels on their roof or some people are even getting little mini wind turbines in their garden. 
Um, they're going to ground source heat pump heating systems. All these things which are designed to be better for the environment. Okay, um, Low energy or renewable energy tariffs, green energy they might be called on there um, from certain um, energy companies. Um, but some individuals will feel that actually renewable energy is too expensive. I've considered solar panels on my house, but to be honest with you, by the time I would have paid off how much it would cost me, um, they will be out of date. So it, the maths doesn't work out, unfortunately, because solar panels are too expensive relatively um, for the benefit they'd bring me. Um, and now I don't want higher energy bills, um, so I'm going to stick with what's cheapest for me, and that's currently gas, which I know is a fossil fuel. Even though it's a bit short term, I feel like I can't really do much else because I would be losing money by using solar. Um, and also, yeah, I don't subscribe to, subscribe to this view, but living near wind farms, people don't often like um, the fact that they create a bit of a noise and a bit of a visual kind of impact as well. That you know, Some people think they look ugly. So they want maybe a, a renewable cheap energy, which wind farms provide, but they don't want it near them. And those people are called NIMBYs, or not in my backyard, so NIMBY attitude. Now, organisations, they see how important it is to be sustainable because they want to look good it's good for uh, pr pub, pub, public relations companies that say we're really green the you know the people like that but also um it's actually cheaper for them uh, it can firstly be good for certain big companies small companies maybe can't afford it but you think about mcdonald's how much how much money they've saved by recycling their used chip fat as biodiesel for their lorries for example they changed all their light bulbs to LED rather than the kind of halogen or filament ones and that saved them over the course of all their stores their you know their branches um, it saved them millions and millions and millions of, of dollars globally so you know they can see the benefit whereas if you're a small company it might be more difficult to maybe implement those little measures um, and there you go I've got uh, examples of McDonald's and you've got examples of McDonald's um, as well as Eddie Stobart uh, and maybe other companies um, that we've covered in your notes as well. So again, these are the examples I talked about, the, the cooking oil and the filament bulbs with LED lighting. Now governments, they have the biggest role to play because they are the most influential. What they can do is they meet and they, they often meet together in like the Paris Agreement and, and you know the uh, COP meetings they have where world leaders of influential countries get together and they set targets and they sign up to pledging to kind of reaching those targets um, and this has worked to try and help reduce global co2 levels with um, trying to keep or maintain temperature rise underneath two celsius and i think they even more recently went to 1.5 degrees celsius because they realized just how much of an effect just one degree celsius would have um, so they're trying to create these targets um, through those global meetings um, and the UK alongside another 195 nations pledged to reduce that global temperature by two degrees uh, in 2015 by investing in low carbon technologies and energy technologies and eventually it's happening um, Boris is, is claimed you know wind energy they think as they see as our future in the UK but also nuclear which isn't bad or isn't as bad as you might think because it's very lacking in pollution. It's just what you do with the waste afterwards is a problem. Let's just chew it into space. No one cares. Just kidding. Um, but also, lots of countries are using things like sustainable transport at local levels. So park and ride schemes, you know, bus networks, that sort of stuff. Congestion charging um, and uh, park and ride. I've mentioned park and ride. Boris bikes. All of those different things, different schemes are all to try and reduce our... Um, use of energy and our waste as well because actually it's part of kind of a global effort so you've just got to be specifically aware of three different ways that different companies um, and individuals and governments the three different kind of tiers of people really um, can differ with regards to how they can implement energy saving measures but also the views in which they might have around that Okay, so NIMBYism, if you're an individual, um, organisations that are maybe smaller, maybe it costs them more, but whereas McDonald's get loads of profit and it's good PR, whereas governments, uh, you know, they, they really need to you know, meet those conditions. What I would say is that under Donald Trump, thankfully he's, he's out the door, but under, under Donald Trump, uh, the United States came out of the Paris Agreement and that was very, very damaging 
um, to the kind of global effort because they thought, well, the, the USA don't do it. Why should we? But I think Joe Biden is firmly on board with this and, and we'll soon see a bit of a U-turn, I think, from the USA to try and really commit to lowering their carbon emissions. OK, so um, now we're on to the very final sections. We're looking at two case studies. One is China and the other one is Germany. So you need one developing country's kind of sustainable energy policy and you need a, a one developed country's sustainable energy policy. And you might remember in lessons we did Energy Vendor or Energy Wendy. That was the um, German version. So what you need to know is how one developing or emerging, so China country, and one developed country are managing their energy resources to be more sustainable. So this is where you've got lots of case study detail. So China um, in um, 2006 created this thing called the Renewable Energy Law and that really kicked it off. And that was a response to the fact that they produce 29% of all carbon emissions on Earth, which is more than any other country. Um, now per person it's less than places like the USA because they're so populated but it's still a big number so they recognize they've got to do something about it it's got seven of the world's ten most polluted cities um, and it burns more coal than USA Europe and Japan combined so it's a big country with um, lots and lots of people to try and provide energy for and that might explain this but they are doing a lot through this renewable energy law which is good stats to quote in an exam um, to try and rectify this so they're doing three things really, um, but they're doing more than that actually, but three that we're going to point out. Firstly, they're using a lot of hydroelectric power and the Three Gorges Dam, um, which is the largest, I believe the largest power station on the planet, certainly the largest hydroelectric power station on the planet, um, produces incredible amounts of energy. Um, and actually the cost of it, which is very high, managed to pay for itself in just a few short years of it opening. Um, so it's incredibly, incredibly um, valuable kind of renewable energy resource. That said, the amount of concrete that went into it and the damage it's done to other aspects through the flooding of the reservoir means it's a little bit controversial. But China are also developing things like solar and wind power. So um, you've got, uh, they are the leading solar power producer in the world and they've got solar power plants being built in the Gobi Desert which they reckon is enough for at least a million homes, uh, which is good. Um, and uh, it's the Dalinga solar power plant is one that you would have got in your notes. The wind energy, which isn't mentioned on this PowerPoint, was the uh, Daban Cheng wind farm. And again, they have developed wind. But another thing China have done, because they recognize they use a lot of coal, is they're actually um, restricting the worst type of coals in areas where there are people living. So that should help hopefully reduce that polluted city status that they've currently got. So that's three things specifically that China are doing. And again, your notes are far more comprehensive for this. In an eight mark question, I'd be expected to either assess how useful these are or how successful they are, or evaluate any aspect of these. It might even ask you to compare China with Germany. Um, but again, prepare yourself for an eight marker of some description on this. So um, now we're going to look at Germany or Energy Vendor. So their reasons for going um, renewable were a bit different to China's. Um, they weren't really a big coal producing nation, but they largely got their energy from nuclear and they were a bit concerned after Fukushima and um, well Chernobyl in 1986. Um, they were concerned that actually they were a bit at risk of, of there being a meltdown. So they went to try and reduce their reliance on nuclear by developing renewables um, and um, this was something that they kind of really committed to through energy vendor or energy transition. So 28% of Germany's electricity is from renewable sources, which puts us a little bit to shame. And they're kind of um, growing quite considerably. They want to try by 2022, so very soon, um, to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by 40%. And they're trying to develop renewable energy by um, creating tariffs um, so that um, companies really are kind of incentivized financially to develop these uh, different kind of sustainable technologies. So they've got the Bavaria Solar Park, which again, I'll leave on there for lots of different benefits um, for you. So you can got some stats down, but again, your notes are more comprehensive. And they've got, I've added that separately, the Nordsee Ost Wind Farm, which um, again, there's some good stats for you to, to utilize if you wanted to in an exam question. The key is really that we've got at least one solar power um, project for Germany and one wind power project for Germany. 
as well as China, and that's why I mentioned the Daban Cheng and the uh, Dalinga different power stations in China as well. So you've got a comparison of the two places and what they're trying to do um, and the reasons for wanting to do it to make themselves sustainable in terms of their energy production. Okay, so I believe that is nearly it so again explain why one developed country is attempting to manage their energy resources in a sustainable way this really doesn't really want you to necessarily talk much about this it wants you to talk about why they are doing it what is the reason for developing it so that's where again your notes are going to be invaluable uh, and this powerpoint is not going to be enough okay so i'm just going to direct you to the, your notes to look at the, the reasons for energy en energy vendor being something that's been developed OK, so um, I believe we're nearly there. There's an example answer for you if you want to use it uh, with stats. Again, stats are still important, um, but that really is the end of this session. So um, thank you for listening. It's been quite a long session, as these revision sessions are, and there are absolutely plenty of gaps from this revision session, which only your notes can fill. And that's really the specific details. So please make sure you've taken my advice on some of the eight markers. Um, go. I would again advise you to go to the eight markers made easy, um, which specifically gives you advice on assess and evaluate questions, but also gives you potential eight mark questions that could appear for this topic towards the end, um, including ones that have already appeared. So get yourself practicing, um, get your stats, you know, and cram your stats before an exam. You need to cram, 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 because there's no way you're going to need to, you're going to remember, sorry, all of these stats by long term revision alone. You're going to have to do a little bit of cramming to just remember the facts and figures the day before or so. Okay, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for listening and um, good luck. Oh, sorry, <laughs> before I go, me still. Um, just as a reminder, you do not answer the section that follows that eight marker, that's the water resource management section. So if there's any doubt, there you go. It's in big capital letters in bold in front of you. Do not answer the water resource management section. Um, and be mindful that the eight marker is also SPAG assessed. All right, that really is now me done. So thank you for listening and cheerio.